All right, let's do this. HarvardNet, Part 1. This is Jason Scott, and you're listening to the Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It podcast, a podcast about technology, history, and getting myself out of debt. Thanks to Daniel Boyd, Jeff Atwood, and hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who are interested in learning about history and also helping me to get out of debt. I was employed by what was variously known as Gale Research Gale, uh, the Thompson Corporation, and a dozen other names throughout the 1990s and the 2000s, but there was one year when I worked for another company. Now, the reason that happened was because things were getting rather tired around Medford, Massachusetts and the data center where I worked. It was more of a case of just not innovating and not adding new customers and the company who owned us not really wanting to be in the data center business anymore. It was always a pretty small operation. And as folks started to leave, transition out, and, and we started to see things go on a downward spiral, it was pleasant enough to work at. And I cared enough about my coworkers, but there was writing on the wall. It just said that going into 2000, things were going to get a little bit dark. So as a result, like others, I started to look elsewhere. And I received a tip from my coworker, Rick, who said, hey, uh, maybe you want to take a look at this place over here. It's a startup. It's an ISP, but it's also a data center. And I bet they could use your skills. Plus, there was a recruiter working for them that was just going around scooping up an incredible amount of people. They were growing. They were on their way up. It, it looked exciting, and it looked like the next logical step for a 30-year-old who was trying to figure out his career. The name of the company was HarvardNet. Now, let's take a little step back here. It was not affiliated with Harvard University. Oh, sure, their logo was crimson, and they had beautiful serifed letters for their logo, but nope, not a minuscule piece of it in any way was associated with that August institution. No, it was a reference to the fact that one of the three companies that had been combined artificially to make HarvardNet was from Harvard, Massachusetts, a very small town in the outskirts of the city. It was, in other words, a sign I should have taken that things weren't going to be on the up and up. It turns out it was a Frankenstein operation between a Virginia networking company, a Maine ISP, and a Massachusetts data center hosting facility. Now, a small spoiler. There was fraud involved, and I'll get into that later, but uh, at the outset, walking in, this looked like the logical next step in my career. I had been working for something like 15 customers for a number of years. Good people. I had gotten along with them socially, and they were in many ways interesting and engaging, but that was a small drop in the bucket compared to the hundreds of customers that HarvardNet had. You see, Internet Maine, which was one of the hosting parts of HarvardNet, had brought along with it all sorts of interesting small customers who had relatively small needs, but added a bit of exotic feeling to it. Everything from political companies through to individual places acting like they were bigger than they were, all the way over to actual big name banks and institutions. I mean, there was a panoply of customers. And as some Somebody who realized he wanted to uh, become more proficient at interacting with a large number of people, well, this seemed like a perfect fit. So I took a tour of the facility, and it was in a uh, X milk factory outside of Boston, and that itself was interesting. It had been retrofitted with all sorts of technology, and the data center. Oh, wow, what a showpiece. At my old 
data center. There was uh, carpeting on the walls, and it was designed to be kind of a renovated office area. So everything was beige and, and gray. But the HarvardNet data center, oh, it looked like something that would come out of a Unity game engine. It was clean and white floors with black and red and yellow as highlights. It looked like something out of science fiction. You walked in there and it was a hot, simmering sense of coolness. You couldn't help but be impressed at row after row of HP machines behind their black and... You couldn't help but walk around there and be impressed by the dozens of HP machines all lined up and humming away. And I thought that this, this was it. So I signed on and I was a Unix administrator, just like I was at the previous company, except that instead of being paid 65000 a year, which I was very, very proud of, I was now being paid 80000 a year. What a jump. I felt like I was on top of the world. Here I was, going 29 on to 30 and making more than my dad ever made at my age. It was a chance to prove myself to him and to everyone I thought cared about such things. Uh, and my job, it, it seemed perfect for me. My job as a Unix administrator was to sit in an office and answer various tickets and trouble that would come down, install new machines, fix up old ones, handle not first level, but second or third level engineer problems, and, and get to the root of things. It was very alluring to me, the idea of being faced with a problem and then swooping in, using all of my skills, uh, letting a person feel secure that their problems and their needs were well at hand, and then solve them, fix them, and then tip my hat, walk away. HarvardNet, in the aggregate, was kind of a plot, a scheme. The scheme was simple. This was a time when IPOs were just going like crazy. You would have a company with barely enough earnings to justify anything, have a whole bunch of investors get totally pumped up in terms of hype, skyrocket, and then have people sell just before the crash. And this was happening all over. And HarvardNet was, and I continue to believe this to this day, designed from the ground up by a number of parties to come off as one of the next big internet businesses and therefore worthy of incredible stock investment when it went to an IPO. And one of the side effects of that was that it held many of the attributes of the relatively small companies that had come before it and yet was being promoted as a next generation of internet service provider. I'll give you a good example. As I've said, the data center was next generation. If you put a customer in that HAL 9000 meets Mirror's Edge data center, they probably thought they were dealing with the creme de la creme of hosting. But if you went to any of the other important data points for networking or hosting and <laughs> woe be to you if you walked in there cold like I did. Well, you were in for a different story. Here's an example. There were a number of machines that were out there that were doing very important work. And this was a time when you could have enough uh, machines to want to name them, but not so many that you would be forced to name them according to a numbering scheme like AW-555-02-NW. No, HarvardNet named them after sins and virtues, and all of the OpenBSD boxes were named after virtues, all of the Windows boxes named after sins. So part of the system might depend on charity and faith, but it also would depend on sloth and envy. And one day I had to go in and do some maintenance, and I found out where these machines were located. I had to go downtown in Boston and drive over to a hotel that had a really good network connection 
And one of the companies that HarvardNet was made of had made a very interesting deal with them. We'll maintain your network, but you've got to give us a room and we can run network out from it. In this way, they could have network connectivity deep in the heart of Boston when it was relatively cheaper to do that as opposed to anywhere else. And in return, all they had to do was give a customer a little bit of time and a place to stick their reservations computer. Well, where did they put them? In a food storage locker. I had to walk into back of house of a hotel, go past packages of food and beer and silverware, and then go through a fridge door, then go through another fridge door, and in the back, uh, lining the shelves, were computers. It was cold back there, but that was the place that the hotel thought they could get away with not having. In the meantime, the two teenagers, yes, teenagers, who had set up the whole system years before, had done so by using something called an X10 remote power controller. This was a device which, given a command through a serial port, could turn a switch on and off. So what they had done was wire X10 power controllers between each machine to every other machine. And by that I mean Envy could control Faith, Charity could control Sloth, you would be able to turn a machine off by activating the switch on a different, random machine. This was what prevented them from going through the pain of going downtown and then into the food storage locker to do any maintenance. Oh, but it gets even more interesting. At one point, I was visiting the Internet main portion up in Portland, Maine, and we had to do some maintenance on the hosting machines. Well, you would think the hosting machine area would be inside of an office building or some sort of warehouse, but it wasn't. It was a townhouse in the downtown part of Maine, again because networks were cheap, but it was a residential building, like it looked like a townhouse, and you went down these stairs and you went into the basement where a crude lock had been put on one of the rooms down there, and when you went into the room, it was a basement. An unfinished basement with no floor, just a whole bunch of concrete dust and pieces of brick. And I'm not exaggerating when I say that these machines were sitting on rickety tables and were just simply medium grade servers, each running something like 1,000 users. And these three machines represented the largest ISP in the state of Maine at the time. No air filtering, a network drop coming in through the back, and an occasional problem of water pooling on the bottom of this unfinished basement. This was the true face of the internet. Turbo grade jank. I want to stress, though, there were very good people there. There were so many people who had found themselves wrapped up into this dream of working for a company, making more money than they ever dreamed of, and using it as a platform to change their own lives. I mean, I wasn't the only one who had bought into this narrative or had found themselves at what seemed to be the ground floor of an amazing opportunity. These were folks who cared about their customers, and they cared about doing the job right. All of that was baked in there. Dozens of folks I met in several states, all of them really focused on doing right by this new idea called HarvardNet. But, as I've implied, that was not to be. You see, HarvardNet was designed for an IPO. It had some notable amounts of investments from several banks and several financial institutions and several uh, let's just call them Boston institutions that uh, hosted there and were building it up as saying that it was a major world-class ISP and hosting operation that would change everything. And so they were doing it to pump up a future IPO. But then there was a problem. You see, somebody did something 
you're kind of not supposed to do. They made a deal with some of the more prominent customers that in the event of an IPO, they would get preferred stock. And the way that they did it, it turns out, was kind of illegal. You're really not supposed to do this in anticipation of pumping up stock. And as a result, they had had a little investigation problem, and it was looking darker and darker for the idea of an IPO. In fact, as the IPO was ultimately canceled, it suddenly became clear why there were certain kinds of people working at HarvardNet. Remember, I say that there were lots of great people, but that wasn't all people. There was an entire group of folks who had come over from a prominent bank who were working there in managerial locations and, of course, would be first in line for all of that great, juicy IPO stock. They weren't in it, you see, to run networking through the world or increase communication or a lot of what had gotten me involved. It was, in fact, their chance for a big, fat payoff. And when the payoff didn't come, things got a little bit intense. My time at Harvard Net was punctuated with lots of highs and lows. The discovery of some of the back-end jankiness was, of course, a real disappointment to me. But the chance to meet all sorts of new customers, people I had never had the chance to interact with under any other circumstance, that was a lot of fun. You know, my coworkers were just amazing people. They were from all over Massachusetts, and they were thinkers. You know, we, we'd sit around and talk about how things could get better, what products we thought would make a difference, and what we could do to the infrastructure from our position and make things run faster, lead to less service calls, the kind of things you do when you care about what you do and, and want to do it even better. We had quite a few large desks, and we had people who were from other departments near us, and they couldn't get enough of our shenanigans. Uh, this was around the time of the whole DVDs can or can't read regions period, and a brand of DVD player had come out that it turned out had a secret menu and you could turn off region encoding. And this was the biggest deal at the time, the idea that you could play a European or Japanese DVD in your DVD player. Well, that was military-grade technology. So I went down there and I purchased one, and I brought it back and put it on my desk. And my coworker Andrew comes by and says, is that what I think it is? And I go, yeah, it is. He goes, well, I would totally get that. And I said, well, I, I could go back down there and get you one uh, while you do some work. And, and then uh, Andreas came by, and, and Michael came by, and Sarah came by, and everybody wanted one. So I went down to the Circuit City and purchased another handful of this DVD player, bringing it back and stacking them up on our desks, one after another, where everyone had paid for theirs. And a sales guy came by and said, what's this? And I said, oh, um, this is our monthly bonus? And the look on his face. You see, <laughs> salespeople, especially in a pretty predatory environment like this, they have um, interesting personalities. Now, not all salespeople are the same, and I've dealt with salespeople that I think are wonderful, but there was a real sense here and there in some of them that they might as well have been selling cinnamon toast as far as selling anything involving Internet. They didn't really have any connection to it. In fact, a lot of them just didn't have the technical chops. I, I remember having a matrix screensaver up on one of the machines and and a salesman came by, and this is no joke, came by and said, oh, wow, is that our internet? And I said, well, well, yes, it is. And he said, wow, we are really advanced here. And I said, yeah, 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 we are, of course. And there were people there who came into my life that uh, have stayed in it. Uh, folks like my friend Charlie, who uh, he and I, long after HarvardNet, uh, were still hanging around, going to movies, talking about culture, even talking about mm, business ideas and going to strange places and, and, and going to Japan one day. And, 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 and he may be one of the most valuable things to have ever come out of that time. And I also had a shining example of how to be 
a great boss. I had a boss. His name was Brian. He was in charge of us lunatics in the support area. And Brian knew how to talk to customers, to subordinates, to superiors, and give them what they needed and communicate it well. I mean, better than anyone I'd ever met before. Uh, he was somebody who could come over and ask you how the job was going. And even if you were a little bit behind or if you missed something, he'd make you feel that it wasn't so much your fault, but something you could make up for very quickly. And he did so well when it came to having our backs with management and stepping in and saying, look, I'll, I'll work with people, okay? I'll figure out what's going on here. I'll get on top of it. Uh, and he was there late into the night, enough that I didn't understand that he had a wife and kids at home. And one of the jobs he had to do, well, it was a terrible job. And it's one of the reasons that I ended up leaving HarvardNet. You see, we didn't keep backups. I thought we did keep backups, but it became very clear that, in fact, no, we weren't keeping backups for shared hosting. We weren't keeping backups for any customers that didn't run their own backup solutions. What we did instead was take money for a backup solution that didn't exist. I mean, it was supposed to exist. There was a tape machine down there that was supposed to work, but it hadn't gotten working yet, and we were still taking the money. And so, every once in a while, a customer would lose their material. And it was Brian's job to call them, to tell them that we didn't have backups, and that we could give them a few months, maybe three months or six months of hosting for free. And surprisingly, they all took that offer. The fact that Brian had to wait till late at night and make phone calls and explain to people that their backups didn't work, I know it tore at him. I know he dreaded those calls, but he made them. And, I'm sure, had an eye for the door at the same time, just like I started to. Now, you can argue about the ethics of knowing that your company does something fraudulent and whether or not you should go running to authorities, but if you step back a moment, the fact that you're doing something you absolutely don't want to do, shouldn't do, shouldn't be made to do, and yet still do it out of a sense of duty and responsibility to your family and earning the wages that you need for them, that was a lesson I learned. I looked at myself and realized I didn't have that bravery, that I would shirk away or come up with excuses or not call. I would, in that situation, just run and hide, try to get away from it. And Brian faced it. It was, in many ways, a beautiful and honorable execution of a dishonorable act. I had a lot of lessons by watching him. So based on that, the fact that the actual uh, stock problems indicated major issues within the company, both financial and ethically, I started to look at getting away from HarvardNet. And ultimately I did, in the most spectacular way possible. And it only led to one single terrifying lawsuit. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It. Thanks to James Bekoyanu, Adam Green, Sam Johnston, and the hundreds of other supporters who have been really helping me get out of debt. Next up, HarvardNet sucks. <laughs>